want to share with you for just a moment how we can do this. Because I know you're probably asking, okay, so you guys have talked about how terrible abortion is. We agree with that. We also understand that uh, rather than being pro-lifers, it's far more biblically, biblically consistent to be abolitionists. So how are you going to do this? You get elected governor, what are you going to do? Well, I think it all boils down to our understanding of the importance of the states. For most of my life, I've been taught that everything the Supreme Court says, well, that's the way it is. Everything is decided at Washington, D.C. So if the U.S. Supreme Court says something is right or wrong, well, then it's got to be right or wrong in all 50 states. Now, this is completely opposite from what our founders intended. The states are crucial if we're going to protect our liberties and our freedoms. Our founders understood that the original 13 colonies that became the original 13 states were sovereign entities. If you read in the Constitution, they were delegating certain power to this new government that they were calling the central government that we call the federal government, right? But it's no more federal than Federal Express. I mean, it's just a, a word that we throw around now. Because it's not federal. It's totalitarian. It believes that it is the final say and that the states ultimately have no say in an issue like abortion, the murder of an unborn child, or the definition or redefinition of marriage. So you see, today we have a union that is split. Because if you look at our culture, you will find that basically there are two halves. There's about 50%. It's actually closer to about 40 to 45% on both sides. One side believes that Washington should dis determine everything. It's a one-size-fits-all. So if you live in Massachusetts and you have a very different, I think we just made, there we go, and you have a very different view of morality, well, then you can force your morality on the other states. So if you live in the Northeast or you live out on the left coast, you look at life very differently than people do in the middle of the country. Now, to illustrate to you how drastic this is, this is the last presidential election map. The red, of course, represents those who voted for President Trump, like him or hate him. The blue represents those who voted for Hillary Clinton. Now, tell me that we're not divided. Tell me that there is not a massive divide within our culture. In fact, I think that that map looks more like that. That's what we have today. And so that's why every four years they'll tell us this is the most important presidential election in our lifetimes, right? Because you see what the presidential election has come to be is let's get our guy elected so we can force our will on the other half. And eventually then the other half gets tired of it and so they get their guy elected so they can force their will on the half that's been forcing their will on them. Is that what the founders intended? Does that even work in a culture as diverse as we are where you take people, like I said, in Massachusetts who look at life very differently from those of us here in Oklahoma? Is there any way possible for a one size to fit all in that kind of scenario? And the answer, of course, is no. So then we have to go back to the founding if we're going to solve this great dilemma. And thankfully, there are answers. In our birth certificate, the Declaration of Independence signed in 1776, you know the story, they clearly articulated some things that ultimately produced the Constitution and everything else. But in the birth certificate, you have all of the founding principles. They're the most important. Principles like, we are endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights, of which are life, liberty, Pursuit of happiness, which later on they defined as being property. The pursuit of your dreams, your, your careers, accumulating uh, things like a house and maybe a yard or a car or a bank account. That was the pursuit of happiness. And then they go on to tell us that governments actually derive their power from the people, not the other way around. 
The governments don't have innate power and grant certain liberties to the people. No, it is the people who hold the power, according to our founders and framers, and so they delegate to the government certain powers, but those powers must operate according to the consent of the governed. Now, I just want to ask you, do you consent to what your government has been doing for the last 40, 50, 60 years? No, I don't even consent to what our state government has been doing. I served two terms in your state legislature, and I didn't consent then. I voted no most of the time. For the two terms that I was there, I had the opportunity to vote on four budgets, and I voted no every time. Because I believed every one of them violated certain key principles, and I was on the speaker's leadership team doing that. That's why I think it is so important for us to understand the consent of the governed. So later on, after the declaration, in 1787, from May to September, delegates meet in Philadelphia. We know this is the Constitutional Convention. And they're forming this new central government that many were very fearful of. So, to make certain that that government could not overreach its authority... After they wrote the Constitution, and the people were really appalled at how the Constitution only said what the government can do, but it didn't say what the government couldn't do, they sent it back to the drawing board, and the chief architect, James Madison, writes 12 amendments, of which 10 are ratified by the states. Now, we know those, right, as the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. They are the handcuffs on this new central government, making certain that the people know that their rights are not going to be abused. And you know that the Tenth Amendment was placed in there, along with the Ninth, to ensure that if anybody still had fears that the states would be overwhelmed by this new government, that we're going to guarantee you that anything we have not explicitly stated and delegated to the federal government in this Constitution is reserved to what? The people in the states. Now, later on, when the people are not really all that interested in this new constitution, the framers began to write what we would call white papers, essays. They called them the Federalist Papers. And what they were trying to do was to explain what they meant in this new constitution. And it's interesting that the chief architect, James Madison, says, well, here's how it's going to work. The powers that are delegated to this new government are few and defined. The powers that remain with the states are numerous and indefinite. Now, do you think that the federal government today believes its powers are few and defined and that the powers of the states are numerous and indefinite? No, it's exactly the other way around. Thomas Jefferson then comes along and says, if you take a step beyond these boundaries... You open up a field of power so vast that you can't define it. Friends, that's what's happened in our lifetime. The federal government has so overstepped its boundaries that today there's nothing that they think they can't decide. So when over 30 state uh, uh, constitutions are amended by the people to define marriage as one man, one woman, the U.S. Supreme Court says, well, they don't have the right to do that. We are all powerful, so what do they do? They go and throw out, including Oklahoma's state constitutions in those amendments that were legally, constitutionally voted on by the people. Now my question would be this, if they can strip that part out of our state constitution, are there any parts that they really couldn't strip out if they wanted to? And you know the answer to that. The answer is no. Jefferson goes on to say that uh, the best thing that we can do in understanding how these two governments are going to function, these two sovereigns, the states, and then this new central government, is just to understand that the states can best govern the home concerns and the federal government, those foreign issues. And that's how the founders saw it. They understood then that the states we're going to have most of the power of the federal government, very little. So this is how they saw it. This is the federal government. These are the state governments. 
Now, do you think that's how they see it today? No, here's how they see it today. It looks like that. In fact, I would argue that they don't even see the state governments as that significant. So I have argued on the legislature floor as a legislator that if all we can do is pick the state song and the state bird and the state game. By the way, when I was there, we, we chose dominoes as our state game. So in case you don't know, well, that was a major accomplishment. Let me tell you, much debate went into that decision. So if, if, if all we can do is what the federal government says we can do, then I would suggest we're redundant. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars, in fact billions, every year to have an Oklahoma state government. Why? If Washington has the power to trump anything our state government does if they don't like it. Why not just cut out the middleman, stop spending the billions of dollars, call Oklahoma, the federal district of Oklahoma, open up an office complex somewhere in Oklahoma City or Tulsa, have someone appointed from Washington, D.C. to come here to Oklahoma and make sure that the laws passed by Congress and D.C. are implemented here in Oklahoma. We save tons of money. You say, well, what do we do with our Capitol building? Sell it and make a great museum, right? I mean, guys, really, I know it sounds silly and it sounds very revolutionary, but think about it. If we are irrelevant, why are we doing it? Why do we have a governor if we're irrelevant? Now, there have been justices on our Supreme Court that have understood this through the years. Here's one of them. Justice Robert Jackson. Listen to what he said in 1949. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are not a suicide pact. Just because our founders agreed at one time does not mean that we always have to agree, especially when they change the rules of the game. Just imagine this. OU goes out onto the football field to play Texas. They've all agreed on the rules, so they have a rule book. And then somewhere in the middle of the game, Texas, by some sleight of hand or some power that Oklahoma didn't know that they had, actually changes the rules and issues a new rule book. And the rules basically say Oklahoma can't score and Texas doesn't have to, to win the game. Now, do you think that Oklahoma would continue to play the game? Wouldn't they have the right to, in protest, say, well, this is ridiculous. These are not the rules we agreed to at the beginning of this match. And would anybody fault the coach and the team for just loading up and coming back home across the Red River? No, of course not. In fact, we would probably be offended if they didn't do that. I would submit to you that is exactly what has happened since the 1770s and 80s here in these United States. We have changed the rule book. So we're not locked into a suicide pact. Now I know you're saying, but what about the Supreme Court? Don't they decide everything? Aren't they the final arbiter? Don't they understand things far better than we? Aren't they so much smarter? Well, let's answer that question by talking about a few times why I don't think they were all that smart. They certainly weren't right. They were completely immoral. In 1857, they said black people are property. Is that correct? Are we duty-bound to recognize that then, even though it's wrong? Supreme Court, they're always right. No, of course not. Later on in 1927, they said it's okay to force sterilization on certain Americans. Is that correct? Is that right? No. In 1944, they agreed with President then Roosevelt, who said it's okay to take Americans of Japanese descent and lock them up. Now, they may lose their homes, their businesses. Some of their families may be separated and never reunited, but this is too bad. It's lawful. And so we did it. In 1973, we didn't talk about that a lot today. We said it's okay to murder a baby. It's not even a baby anyway. Just a few years ago, 2015, this is deemed always correct, always perfect Supreme Court, infallible said, who said that marriage was just a man and a woman? Who said that? God. But who said that, you know? And they changed the definition. Guys, the Supreme Court is not infallible. They are not always right. And so then, are we duty-bound to obey them when they're wrong? And yet, do you know what my opponents are saying? 
Yes, we are. Interestingly enough, the chief, ar- ar- the chief architect of the Constitution didn't agree with that. Listen to what he says in the Virginia Resolution in 1798. He says, when the, the federal government overreaches its bounds, the states are duty-bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. James Madison calls the overreach of federal government evil. Jefferson says something very similar when he says, whenever the general government, that be the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are, now listen to these words, unauthoritative, void, and of no force. That's what Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, says. So now let's take Roe v. Wade. Jefferson would say, it's just the opinion of the court. They don't have the authority in the Constitution to decide on the matter of life. It's already been decided in the Declaration of Independence. Therefore, Roe v. Wade is unauthoritative, void, and of no force. That's what Thomas Jefferson would say. Unfortunately, that's not what we say. We bow down and we go along. Friends, let me tell you something. Going along has its consequences. If you jump into a car with some folks who tell you on the way that they're going to rob a bank and you stay in the car and then you're all captured after the bank robbery, guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to lock you up with them. They're going to call you an accomplice. You went along. If you allow someone to get into your vehicle with illegal drugs and you're pulled over and they search your car and they find those drugs, it's not just the person that brought them into your car who's going to be held accountable. It will also be you or me. We are an accomplice. You know what the Scripture says. God formed us in our mother's womb before we were ever seen, before we were ever known. Now, i got to tell you that I didn't always believe these things. One time I was a pro-lifer. And then I met some folks who were reading verses to me like these verses. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. I kind of bristled up at the beginning saying, who are these people to tell me I'm a preacher? I mean, for Pete's sake, I better preacher since I was 16 and I'm 58. That's 42 years of ministerial jurisprudence, right? (laughs) And then I started to realize they were right. See, I'd been wrong. My thinking that said, well, here's what we do. We write a law that protects all of the babies older than 20 weeks and we're doing a big thing. Well, now, that 2.8% Of all of the abortions? Well, to save them is a good thing, but what about the other 97.2% that are before 20 weeks that are murdered? Well, it's just a blob of tissue. Wrong. Here's a 3D ultrasound of a baby at 17 weeks. Does this look like a blob of tissue to you? That looks like a baby. I mean, I guarantee you somebody shows that to a first grader and asks them, what is that? They won't say cow. They won't say lung. They won't say, well, that's a puppy. I honestly believe that a first grader would say, well, that's a, that's a baby. There's an ultrasound at 20 weeks. Does that look like a blob of tissue? There's a 3D ultrasound from 20 weeks. Does that look like a blob of tissue that's being ripped from its mother's womb? No. You know that that's not what that is. But here in Oklahoma, every business day, 15 to 20 of those babies are murdered. Every business day. Accounting to more than 5,000 Babies every year here in good old conservative Oklahoma where we have 1.3 million evangelical Christians. There are some 7,000 pro-life churches. 
where millions are spent every year on church sound boards, lights, and video equipment, where we are surrounded by all of the outward trappings of Christianity. And this, this is happening right here. So you see, in my life, I was forced to consider the errors of my ways. For instance, I had to rethink this error thinking I was doing good by incrementally slowing abortion through regulatory measures like a 20-week pain-capable bill when what I was really doing was protecting the murder of those 20 weeks and younger. That's a hard pill. I also had to face this error. Because of my love for the founding era, I had allowed myself to think that this issue could only be resolved by the Supreme Court in Washington. I guarantee you most of your pastors believe that. I'm a pastor. I talk to lots of pastors. The overwhelming majority of them are wrong about this. Well, we can't do anything. The Supreme Court has ruled. When did Supreme Court become God? What if the Supreme Court ruled that the gospel's wrong? What would we do then? Now, of course, a lot of people are saying, well, Fisher's nuts. He's just a kook. And he's only running on abolition. Well, that would be true except for the fact that it's not. <laughs> I mean, these are our four primary issues that we're running on. Yes, Abolishing abortion is number one to me because I figure if we can't get that right, we won't get anything else right. right. Think about this. A culture that will murder the most innocent unborn among them, what else would it not do? It would murder the old if they really get into the way. Uh, wouldn't they murder those who have mental Handicaps and challenges or physical handicaps and challenges? Or how about those who just hold very awkward and unpopular philosophical positions? You say, well, no, it would never happen. It has. So if we can't get that issue right, I'd submit to you we won't get anything else right. It's not any big deal for a government that allows the murdering of unborn babies to steal from you as well. It's kind of like Bill Clinton if he will lie to his wife about his own faithfulness, I bet he'll lie to me. Sure, of course. So no, we're not a single issue campaign. They're just saying that to make us look minimal. There's a statement there on the screen, and I'm, I'm quickly coming to the end here. But there's a statement there on the screen that I want you to read and I want you to think about. The murder of an innocent baby is not and must never be a political issue to the church. And yet that's exactly what it is to most churches. That's why they won't talk about it. It's political. Someone came to me about a year or two ago and said, Dan, i, I got to know what I, what I need to do. I said, well, tell me your story. He said, well, a few weeks ago, our pastor got up into the pulpit and said, ladies and gentlemen, since the Supreme Court has ruled that marriage can also involve same-sex partners, marriage is now a political issue and I can no longer preach on it. And this person with tears in their eyes said, what do I do? And I said, leave that church as quickly as you possibly can. Leave it. And maybe as you walk out the door, rebuke the pastor and the leadership. And yet somehow we've allowed this to become political. Now let me give you a perfect example of how we've done it and what the consequences are. On November the 17th, we had our very first abortion-free state rally. It's over the south side of Oklahoma City. We had it at a church many blocks away from what I call a killing center. I refuse to call it a clinic. It's a killing center. There was a church less than 500 feet from the killing center. Now this was one of the coldest days that we had had to that point this winter. Wind was blowing about 68 miles an hour. Blew over one of our speakers. It was blowing so hard. We had asked that pastor less than 500 feet, his church, from the killing center, if we could use his parking lot. We didn't want to go in the building. We were going to be in the parking lot. 
The church said, oh, we can't do that. Now, understand, we're pro-life, but we can't do that. So we had to meet at a church four or five blocks away. So we did. As I pulled up there that morning and started to turn to go down the street where this other church was, I drove right in front of this church that had told us no. By the way, it's an evangelical church. Wonderful looking facility. They had placed on their marquee out in front of their church, in your mother's womb, Jesus loved you. Well, how daring of them. What a tremendous feat of faith. Rather than allow us to meet on their parking lot, just throw up a little slogan on the marquee. Guys, that's what churches are doing all over Oklahoma. We're just throwing little slogans up there because you see, for us, it's political. So let me ask you, when everybody says, well, you just can't disobey the law, well, what do we say then about the Hebrew midwives who disobeyed the law? What do we say about Daniel and his three friends who disobeyed the law? What do we say about Jesus when He dared to heal on the Sabbath, which was against Jewish, not God, but Jewish law? All of the officials and powers in those people's day said what they did was wrong. And they did it anyway. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ought to be anarchists, and I certainly believe in law and order. I'm actually calling for it. I'm calling for law and order is what I'm calling for. Murder's wrong. It's just wrong. It's evil. I'm asking us to enforce the law and stop it. That's what I'm asking us to do. That's lawless. And yet I'm being called lawless. Nothing morally wrong should ever be legally right. Nothing. And yet it is. So I just want you to know that if I'm elected governor, when, when the feds pass laws that are unjust and immoral, I'm going to ignore them as governor. In the spirit of James Madison, who said, it's evil and the states ought to interpose. That means get in between the federal government and its citizens. Just like the citizens of South Carolina did in 1832 when they said the tariff of abominations is unthinkable and we're not going to obey. Just like the state of Wisconsin did after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed and they said no way, no how. Now by the way, they're not in the South last time I checked. They're in the north. And they said, if a slave makes it to Wisconsin, we're not going to obey that law and turn them back in. They're going to be free if they get to our state. And they actually did it. Just like the Christian abolitionists did in the 1800s when they demanded an end to the evil sin of the slave trade and worked every way they knew how to actually free slaves and defied the government in the process. Just like Martin Luther King did. Now, peacefully, I'm not suggesting that we get you know, torches and pitchforks or load guns, but just like they defied the Jim Crow laws of his day. We celebrate these people, don't we? And yet, what are we doing? Well, last Sunday was Sanctity of Life Sunday, and I'll bet you your pastor preached a Sanctity of Life sermon. I bet they were preached all over Oklahoma. I guarantee you the Baptists did it. Baptists are just about to observe Rose Day here in just a few days. We're going to pass out another bunches of bouquets of roses and applaud legislators for the noble acts of pro-lifeism. When I was there, and I know, they won't lift a finger to end abortion. And if you have any bill that even comes close, they'll kill it. Just like the babies. Now, individually, I'm sure they're all pro-life. And I'm sure, individually, they probably actually do think abortion's wrong. But they're not going to stop it, guys. And most of these pastors preaching these sanctity of life sermons 
won't have me in their churches. I know because they've said no. A pastor just this week made his final decision not to allow me to preach in his church in Ada. Here's the crazy thing. He's my friend. I've preached in his church many times before. And he decided, he and his leadership decided this week, it's just too doggone controversial to have Fisher right now while he's running for governor. I'm telling you guys, we have blood on our hands here. And there is a way to do this. Oklahoma just rises up and says, no. No. You know that. No is a powerful word. But we haven't said it in a long time except to babies. No, you can't live. How about we say no to the abortionist? How about we say no to being incrementally pro-life? How about we say yes to life and no to murder? You say, but Dan, it won't work. They'll thwart you every way. They'll probably impeach you. They may even throw you in jail. Okay. You say, you mean you want to be impeached? Well, I didn't say that. (laughs) You mean you want to be thrown in jail? Well, no. I have visited jails in a ministry position. I've never been in jail. Except one night we almost got thrown in jail when we were kids because we were throwing water balloons on Halloween. So we almost, we were almost locked up. So why would I say that? Okay. Well, I don't want to go down as the first governor in our history of Oklahoma that was impeached. Or the first governor in Oklahoma who was thrown in jail. But if it was for trying to stop murder, isn't that worth it? Yeah, see, it is. Now, I want to close with this story. I wish that I had met this gentleman, but I must trust the person who tells the story. Uh, she, for years, was a pro life advocate. So I want you to know this. But Penny went all over the country talking about the evils of abortion. Probably, had some of us been able to visit with her, she would have become an abolitionist pretty quickly. But she was giving a talk at one of her events, and when it was over, an old gentleman came up to her with tears running down his face, she said, and he spoke in a very broken German kind of English. And he said, you know, what is happening today with abortion is just like what was happening in Germany. He said, I lived in Germany during World War II. He said, I attended a little church that was right next to a set of railroad tracks. And we noticed that on a certain time every Sunday a train started passing our church and then we started hearing people on those trains crying out for help. And we didn't know what in the world was going on. And then we finally figured out these people were being forcibly relocated. Later on he said we found out all about it. They were being sent off to those concentration camps. He said, but this was very troubling to us to hear these cries coming from these trains and we're right there in the middle of our service. Something had to be done about this evil. And he looked at Penny and he said, do you know what our solution was? Since we knew the time every Sunday when the train would pass, just about the time the train got there, we would turn up the organ and sing louder. And that way we couldn't hear the cries. And then the old man looked at Penny and he said, I'm telling you, that was years ago. And I still hear those cries. I still hear them. This many years later. Guys, this is why we have to stand up. Our movement to abolish abortion, as well as return proper government to Oklahoma, stop the stealing through overtaxation and overregulation, Audit the daggum thing from top to bottom. Reassert state sovereignty. All of this truly is in the finest traditions of our republic. And you and I are writing the next chapter in the battle between good and evil. Between light and darkness. We cannot. We must not 
delay another moment. Babies' lives are at stake. What will you do about that? Father, in Jesus' name, today we've heard a lot about life and about death. It's kind of heavy and it's kind of hard. This, this, this is painful to talk about. It's painful to look at the pictures that John showed early on. But it's true. It's hard to hear these truths. It's hard to watch these, these dances and see the interpretive musical application to these hard truths. And yet, Lord, we must face it. But it can end on an upbeat. It can end with a crescendo if we will do what we know is right. It isn't going to be easy. Every obstacle is being thrown in front of us now. And if we happen to get elected, those obstacles will continue to be thrown at us. The courts will say you can't do it. The legislature will most likely say you can't do it. But if the people, those 1.3 million evangelicals in Oklahoma, not counting the Catholics and the other faith groups, if just that 1.3 million evangelicals stand up and say, oh yes it can, and it will be, it will be done. Please awaken your church. Or, we deserve any and every judgment that falls upon us. In Jesus' name. Friends, we are running a fight of our lives here. This is my website. If you haven't seen these videos, we have all kinds of materials on our website. This meeting is not about me running for governor. But since I'm here, I'm asking for your help. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and be a part of this day. God bless you. And God give us the courage of our convictions. Thank you so much.